The subject of this webcast is the stability trends of radicals, and the first thing I want to say about radical stability trends is that they're somewhat complicated. This is because radical formation is influenced both by the stability of the radical itself and by the strength of the bond that breaks to form the radical. So when we see an intermediate that's a radical in a particular reaction, this doesn't necessarily indicate that it's the most stable intermediate under those conditions. A number of other possible explanations exist. For example, the bond that broke to form that radical could have been the weakest in the sense of bond dissociation energy, or kinetically, we might be under a situation of kinetic control, meaning that the rate to form one radical is faster than the rate to form another radical. We'll see examples of this in the first part of this webcast, but we'll also see cases where radical stability can be explained by things like resonance delocalization. To begin, let's consider the effect of substitution pattern on radical formation. So imagine we had a hypothetical substrate that looked like this with all three different kinds of substituted CH bonds. So here on the left we have a tertiary CH bond, in the center a secondary CH bond, and on the right a primary CH bond. When we subject this compound to conditions of radical halogenation, which substitutes a halogen atom for one of the CH bonds, we end up primarily with selective substitution at the tertiary position, which seems to imply the intermediacy of a tertiary radical. Our natural inclination, then, is to treat the tertiary radical intermediate as the most stable intermediate under these reaction conditions. But in fact, there's something a little bit deeper at play here, and it has to do with the bond dissociation energies of the starting CH bonds. What we find is that the tertiary CH bond itself is weaker than the secondary and primary CH bonds. And being the weakest bond, meaning it has the lowest bond dissociation energy, we look to the tertiary CH bond as the one most likely to break. This doesn't necessarily mean that the tertiary radical is the most stable intermediate. It just means that the dissociation energy, the energy to break the CH bond, is lowest for the tertiary CH. For another example, consider the addition of a radical to a double bond. Under these conditions, HBr adds across the double bond, and as you probably already know, this can happen in two senses. The bromine can either end up attached to the more substituted position, this is what occurs under polar conditions, and we call that Markovnikov addition, or the bromine can end up attached to the less substituted position, and this is what we call anti-Markovnikov addition of HBr. This is what we find under radical conditions. The bromine ends up attached to the less substituted position, and hydrogen to the more substituted position. Now this, too, based on the mechanism, seems to imply the intermediacy of a tertiary radical intermediate, one in which the bromine radical, which is a propagating radical in this mechanism, adds to the less substituted position, forming the more substituted radical. And although, again, we may be inclined to believe that this radical is more stable, and the results of this reaction point to that, in fact, there's another explanation that's more likely given other experimental information. In fact, the reason the bromine adds to the less substituted position has more to do with the steric environment of each position as opposed to the stability of the product radical. This is because this step of the reaction, in which bromine adds to the double bond, is either thermoneutral or exothermic, and so the influence of the reactant on the nature of the transition state is large. And what we find is that the transition state to form a bond at the less substituted position is much lower in energy than the transition state to form a bond between bromine and the more substituted position. This leads to a much faster rate for the formation of the tertiary radical. And so what we're seeing under these conditions is kinetic control. The faster rate of formation of the tertiary radical in this addition reaction leads to the primary bromide selectively, leads to the anti-Markovnikov product. So although you're seeing that substitution pattern is more complicated than a straightforward stability trend, what we can say in general is that more substituted radicals form more readily than less substituted radicals. This is true especially for the substitution and addition reactions of hydrocarbons and alkenes that you see on this slide. 
Electron donating and withdrawing groups can actually influence the stability of radicals themselves, and we know this because some persistent radicals, radicals that exist long enough for us to observe, are substituted with electron donating and withdrawing groups. The way this works is essentially by resonance. So to start with a withdrawing group, consider a carbonyl adjacent to a radical center. In this compound, the radical character is delocalized over carbon and oxygen, and we can see that by drawing some simple curved arrows. The spreading of radical character seems to stabilize this radical, and while this is sort of half true, we'll see that the situation is slightly more complicated once we take frontier MO theory ideas into account. We can think about the same sort of electron flow when an electron donating group is adjacent to a radical. The situation here is very similar. The lone pair on the donating group can send an electron toward the radical center, illustrating that radical character is delocalized over, in this case, both nitrogen and carbon. Now let's look at this from a frontier molecular orbital theory perspective, and let's begin with the electron donating groups. The effect of an electron donating group in an orbital sense is to raise the orbital energies of the radical. So we can think about the radical over here on the left-hand side on its own without the electron donating group. And we can imagine that it has a half-filled H, which is also referred to as a SOMO for singly occupied molecular orbital, and a LUMO up above it. We can also think on the right-hand side of the donating group's frontier orbitals on their own. And the most important FMO here is the high-energy HOMO of that in our 2 group basically corresponding to the lone pair on nitrogen. When we allow these two sets of orbitals to interact, we get the orbital energy diagram in the middle. This is sort of equivalent to bringing the radical and the donating group close enough to one another to form a bond. When this happens, what we see is an interaction between the HOMO of the donating group and the SOMO of the radical. This leads to two new molecular orbitals one corresponding to a somewhat lower energy lone pair on nitrogen, and the other corresponding to a higher energy new SOMO. This higher energy SOMO is really the true half-filled orbital of the substituted radical, and we can see that its orbital energy is relatively high, especially related to this compound that just lacks the donating group altogether. The general conclusion that we can pull from this is that radicals substituted with electron donating groups are nucleophilic. That half-filled orbital is high in energy and wants to send its electron toward an electrophile. So radicals substituted with donating groups, logically, will react rapidly with electrophiles and less rapidly with other nucleophiles. A similar situation exists for radicals substituted with electron withdrawing groups. In this case, we again treat the radical on its own on the left of this orbital energy diagram with its H or SOMO orbital and its LUMO. And we treat the withdrawing group on the right. And the most important feature of the withdrawing group is this low energy LUMO. In the case of the carbonyl, it's a pi star corresponding to the CO double bond. The most important orbital interaction is between the SOMO and the LUMO now. These are close in energy and they interact strongly. And what we find is that the energy of that half-filled molecular orbital is lowered relative to the starting half-filled molecular orbital. The conclusion here is that the radical is now electrophilic. It wants to inherit electrons from a nucleophile to fill this low energy half-filled orbital. Electrophilic radicals react rapidly with nucleophiles, but not as rapidly with electrophiles. And so overall, taking both the electron donating and withdrawing case, we see that radicals aren't as simple as ions in terms of nucleophilicity and electrophilicity. We can't just say that a radical is always nucleophilic or always electrophilic. Instead, we have to recognize the influence of substituents attached to the radical. Although these substituents stabilize the radical in some sense through resonance delocalization, they can also increase its reactivity depending on the donating or withdrawing power of the substituent.